Uh, I want you to go in, in your Bibles if you have it. Uh, if you don't, it's going to come up on the screen behind me. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9 says this, At, as it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor his righteousness endures forever. I want to speak today on the thought, the big problem with biblical prosperity. The big problem with biblical prosperity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it's alive. We thank you that it's powerful. We thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that it's able to get into our life and penetrate and bring supernatural change from the inside out. We thank you that when we read the word, it is reading us, it's convicting us, it's challenging us. And so as we come around your word today, we pray that it would do exactly that. We want to leave better than when we came in. We want to leave bigger than when we came in. We want our mind to be renewed through your word today, in Jesus' name, and everyone said, now, culture, where you grew up, your nationality, creates paradigms. A paradigm is a set of assumptions that determine your reality. So these are things that you just believe because you've always believed it, and it sort of shapes how you think. It, it will tell you what you think is right, what you think is wrong. Church culture is a little bit like that. I don't know if you've ever visited another church different to Word of Life, and you've gone there, and they sing the same songs, but they sing it differently. And very rarely do we say, oh, they're singing it differently. We usually say they're singing it wrong because our set of assumptions determines our reality. And so culture shapes us. I grew up in Australia. I lived in America for the past 20 years. And so the nation, those nations have shaped my culture, even my expectation. Living in America has shaped the way I think compared to when I lived in Australia. I was just there recently in Brisbane. And United Airlines had strategically left my bag in New York, even though I was going to Sydney. And I arrived in Australia with no bag because it was in New York and I was in Sydney. And so when I got to the hotel, I asked the girl in the hotel, I said, uh, uh, is there a men's store close by that I can go? I needed to buy a belt. Is there a men's store close by? And she said, yes, sir, there is a men's store close by, but all the shops are closed now. It's 5 p.m. at night. 5 p.m., all the shops were closed at 5 p.m. That's almost blasphemy in America. I was like, how are these people going to make any money? And, and so she didn't think anything of it. Why? Because that's just the way things are at. Our culture shapes the way we think. This is clearly evident when we read the writings of Paul because Paul had a, a mindset, had a culture that had been developed by his Jewish foundations. He said of himself, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In fact, when it comes to Jewish culture, I am the man that's got the plan. I know everything about it. And so Paul had been shaped by Hebrew thinking, and he would have, he would have been uh, declaring over his life that he was living in the blessings of Abraham, the prosperity of Abraham, the, uh, the, the inheritance of Abraham, because that's a part of his roots. And you see that coming out in Paul's writings, that he has that expectation, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He had that abundance, he had that blessing, that prosperity mentality. He said, he said, I know what it is to abound and I know what it is to be a base. It doesn't matter what situation I am in. I know that God is in it and I'm going to be blessed. Why? Because he had a blessing mentality. So when Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, he is writing from this cultural perspective and expectation that God wants to bless our life. God wants to enrich our life. And the context of the passage we just read in 2 Corinthians is that Paul is talking about a well-thought-out, intentional, deliberate plan of giving so God can have a plan of blessing you back. It's a plan of sowing and reaping. And so the mindset of this chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is biblical generosity. And then Paul writes this, as it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor his righteousness endures forever. Now, Paul in his writings 
refers uh, either directly or indirectly 31 times to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms has a, had a big impact on Paul's life. And so Paul knows very well that Old Testament wisdom is the secret source to New Testament blessing. He knew if there's going to be a key to me being blessed in the New Testament, then the secret source to that blessing exists in the Old Testament. And verse 9 of chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians is the secret source. And it comes from Psalm 100. And, 12. and so I thought today as we study this topic, it would be really good for us to read Psalm 112. This is what it says from verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Like dawns in the darkness for the upright, he is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with a man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. That's right there in 2 in Second Corinthians. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. And so Psalm 112 is the, it's the secret source of our message today. We're going to soak ourselves in this psalm. Now, the challenge for today is that there are many people uh, who have a, a problem just with the word prosperity. Like as soon as I said the word prosperity, as soon as I read that bit, wealth and riches, as soon as I just mentioned that in Christian context, already you, your brain is starting to shut down. You're like your defenses are starting to go up. You're already going to ignore 90% of what I say. Just because of one word. That's a biblical word. That's a God word. That's a kingdom word. That's a heaven word. And I want to encourage you today that you need, the only person that can benefit out of you not prospering is the devil. The only person that can benefit from the Christian living in lack and living in poverty is the devil. We've got to get our heads into a place where we start to believe what God says about us, not what the world says about us, not what the devil says about us, not what religion says about us. You've got to get your head into a place where you start to dare to believe what God says about us. And I want to encourage you, don't leave, don't shut down, don't ignore, hang in to the end of the message and maybe God will speak to you in a powerful way. Here's a big problem with biblical prosperity. The big problem with biblical prosperity is that prosperity exists in your head and in your heart way before it ever begins in your hand. It begins in your head and in your heart long before it exists in your hand. All prosperity begins with praise. You can have absolutely nothing, but if you have him, you have everything. You can lose everything, but if you've got Jesus, you still have everything. The Bible says right there in verse 1, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise is the biblical prerequisite for all prosperity. Everything that God can bless you with, it begins here with a praise to God. You can, you can be like Job, who in just a moment lost everything, lost his money, lost his family, lost his health, lost everything. A man that was unbelievably blessed and lost everything in a moment. You can lose everything in a moment, but if you can keep your praise, 
If you can keep your joy, if you can keep your trust in God, praise is the beginning for everything. The thing that poverty cannot take away is your praise. I've been in meetings where people have been blessed abundantly and they can praise God. I've been in areas where they had no money, they had no resource. I've been in the third world, I've been in Eastern Europe, I've been all over, and I've been in countries where people were living in lack. But the one thing that they didn't lack was praise. They knew how to praise God, they knew how to seek the face of Jesus. Praise says, I am always prosperous, no matter how it looks. I'm always prosperous, no matter how it looks. Kevin Butler and I were having a conversation earlier this week, and he talked about a moment where he was, you know, feeling bad about something, feeling like there was a challenge in his life, and, and, uh, and, and he was sort of going to God, and God, like, why is this thing here? And, you know, sort of complaining about the difficulty. And then he just stood back and just started thinking about, hang on, I've, I've got a great business, I've got a great house, I've got a great family, I, I drive a car, I've got clothes on my back, I'm eating three meals a day and snacks. He started to realize that his life was a lot better than he thought about it when he put it in context. What is that? That's acknowledging the goodness and the greatness of God in, in our life. Hebrews chapter 13, 15 says, Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that acknowledges his name. Some of you have already been doing that today. You had a horrible week. All hell broke loose. Some of you got bad news. Got bad news about family. Bad news about your money. Bad news about your health. Bad news at the job. Bad news because you watched the media. And you've come in a bit weighted down, but you walked in the door and you started to praise God. You started to lift your hands. You started to sing. You started to declare God's goodness. Already today, you have victory. Already today, you are winning because you didn't let the past rob you of your praise. That we're here to praise God today. Praise declares the greatness of God. Psalm 150, praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise declares the greatness of God and reinforces our dependence on God. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Praise reinforces our dependence on God and puts God in charge of our haters. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 22. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Amnon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. Praise puts God in charge of our haters and creates an atmosphere of expectation. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Praise creates an atmosphere of expectation and makes a bold declaration of God's goodness. And his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Praise makes a bold declaration of God's goodness and brings heaven's presence. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Praise brings heaven's presence and brings his presence unlocks joy. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I tell you, these scriptures are going to mess with your head if you don't believe God wants to bless you. Praise unlocks joy and joy of the Lord is our strength. Acts chapter 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. They started to praise God in the midst of difficulty. The presence of God enters in. The glory of God enters in. God starts to shake the foundations of the jail. They're, they're 
their chains break off, the doors swing open, prisoners are set free. That's what happens in an atmosphere of praise. Is there anybody in the house today that wants to give God a praise? Is there anybody at Word of Life, anybody online, why don't you stand to your feet? Come on, let's give him a crazy praise for about 30 seconds this morning. Come on, lift your voices. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Stand up at home. Stand up in your living room. Stand up in your bedroom. Declare it. Let your neighbors hear it. Come on, declare the praises of God. God, we're here to worship you. Is there anybody glad he healed you? Is there anybody glad he saved you? Come on, give him a praise right now. Is there anybody glad that you made it through? They said you wouldn't make it, but you made it through. They said you wouldn't get there, but you've made it through. They said you wouldn't win, but you're winning. They said you'd never get there, but you are a child of God. Heaven is your destination. You've got a reason to praise him. I don't care what the devil has told, stole from you. He can restore the years that the canker worm has taken away. He can restore back to you everything that's been stolen from you. Just got to get a praise in your heart. It all begins with a praise. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man. There's the connection. The praising man, the praising person, is a blessed person. Blessed is the man. This, this should be our expectation. I'm a worshiper. I'm a praiser. Blessed is the man. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man. You've got to start to declare God's blessing on your life. You've got to lift your expectation. The Bible says that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. The blessing of the Lord makes you prosper, and the prosperity is accompanied with praise. You and I, we need to position ourselves. We need to get ourselves into an expectation mode of God's blessing. We need to receive it, and we need to give it. We need to believe that God is going to do what God said he's going to do, that God wants us to be blessed, that God wants us to prosper, that God wants us to be healthy, that God wants us to live in his blessing. And we've got to get our mind into that, especially, especially if life has kicked the expectation out of you. There's nothing like some circumstances to come along in your world to strangle your expectation of God's best. There's nothing like some situations to come and the devil to get on your shoulder and say, see, God doesn't want you to be blessed. See, you should never prosper. See, you're always going to live in lack. I've heard some of your stories. Some of you are in America because you're a refugee and you've told stories about when you were back at home and how blessed you were and how prosperous you were and how filled you were. And then you got chased out of the country. You had to leave. Didn't necessarily want to, but had to leave your country. And you arrived in America with nothing. And it's been a struggle. And it's been difficult. And, you, and, and you've been up against it. And you're trying to find out when's the next meal going to come in. I've heard stories about people who've come here and, and, and then their uh, immigration status has changed. And they don't have a, a license. And they don't have a, a job. They don't have, they don't have a work permit. And they're struggling to say, come on, God, I, I, I need to be blessed. But I'm here to tell you today, before anything, you are a child of God. You've got to get your expectation back. You've got to get your belief back. You've got to get your trust back. You've got to start to learn a new culture, and it's a culture of heaven, and that God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to thrive. You're not an ex-anything. You are a new creation. All the old is passed away. Behold, everything is becoming new. Don't let your past no matter how difficult it was, rob you from what God wants to do in your future. Praise sets the bar. I don't like where I've been, but I have a huge expectation for where I'm going. If the devil can't get your joy, he can't get your goods. Praise is an expectation in your heart. God is good all the time. And all the time, 
God is good. I, I, I have an expectation in my heart. I, it doesn't look good right now. It looks pretty bleak right now. It looks difficult right now. But I believe that my God is bigger than my past. I believe my future is better than my history. I believe that God before me. And if God before me, who can be? That's what the Bible says. You've got to get that expectation in your heart. I heard this quote from Michael J. Fox, who's struggling with Parkinson's. And he was in an interview and he said this. He said, with gratitude... Optimism is sustainable. With gratitude, optimism is sustainable. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. A good man brings forth good things out of the good store. There's, you you got to get your heart right. you got to get your expectation right. If you leave here with nothing else today, leave here saying, I've got to get the inside of me, believing God for God's best. I've got to change the way I think. I've got to change my expectation, especially if life has tried to slam it out of you. Life may have done it, but you've got to praise God and get a healthy heart. Maybe church culture has kicked it out of you. Kick the blessing expectation out of you. Religion wants to make you a slave to the system and codependent on the system. Jesus wants to make you strong. Jesus wants to move you into a position of authority. Religion wants to keep you in a position where you need the religion. And so it will preach to you lack, just getting by. If I just have enough to get by. That sounds, so, that sounds so holy. Well, I don't need to be super blessed. If I just have enough to get by, that's all I need. And religious people make that sound like, whoo, you're too Christian for this church, too Christian for... We, 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 we. But you think about that statement. I, I, I only need enough to get by. It sounds holy, but it's... In, Incredibly selfish. I just need enough for my needs. I don't need to worry about you. I don't need to worry about the world around me. I don't need to worry about anybody else. If I've just got enough for me to survive, then that's good. No, that's incredibly selfish and it's not biblical. God doesn't want you just to have enough for your needs. He wants you to have your needs and have enough in you so you can give to the needs of others. God wants to move you into a place of authority. The Bible says it's better to give than it is to receive. Now, this may be a situation right now that you are in a receiving mode. It, life is long. We go through seasons. And maybe right now, for you to be blessed, is that you need somebody to give you the blessing. So you need to be blessed. And so you're praying for God's blessing to come to your life because you've been struggling. It's been difficult. You're in hardship. You're down. And so you need to be blessed. And it's okay in that situation to believe God to be blessed. You've heard my testimony on how in the early years of my Christianity, I had to pray jobs in. I had to pray money in. I had to pray clothing in. There's times I had to believe God for his resource to come into my life. And other people were able to be the blessing in that situation. But it is better to give than it is to receive. So once I move from needing you to bless me to me being in the position where I can bless others, the Bible says when I can give, that's better than when I'm receiving. It's a position of authority. The borrower is servant to the lender. So the lender is in the position of authority. So God says, I, this is where you're at right now. I love you. It's all good. Don't freak out. Praise me in the midst of the circumstances. But here's what. I don't want you to stay there. I want to I wanna bless you. I want to increase you. I want to prosper you. I, I, I want to see you grow. Prosperity is a growth journey. If you don't have any money for food and you're starving, then prosperity is a meal a day. If you've got a meal a day, then it's two meals a day. You got two meals a day, it's three meals a day and snacks. That's God's blessing on your life. So God wants us to be blessed and, and religion tries to kick it, out, kick it out of us. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord and who greatly delights in his commandments. Who's blessed? The person and the purpose of God in their life. The person who has the purpose and person of purpose of God in life. That's the blessed person. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, has reverence and honor for the person of God. I love what the theologian Clark said. He said, it's not enough to fear God. 
we must also love him. Fear will deter us from evil. Love will lead us to obedience. Blessed is the man who greatly delights in his commandments. In other words, that they are living in the purpose of God, the word of God. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither in In all that he does, he prospers. But how does it start? Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the pathway of the sinner or sits in the seat of the scornful. All negativity, all ungodliness is going to lead you to a place of incapacity. You're walking, you're standing, now you're sitting. Now Now you're immobile. You're not moving. You're not moving forward. That's what all negativity does. And there's so much ungodly. You don't have to go too far to get ungodly thinking. Just watch TV, Fox, CNN, watch the mainstream media, go online, look at some people on Facebook, Instagram. We are bombarded with all sorts of negativity. You don't even have to go out of the church. You're going to meet some people in the lobby. We're bombarded with all sorts of things that rob us. But the Bible says, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't stand in the pathway of the sinner. For whatever you do, for the love of all things holy, don't sit in the seat of the scoffer. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Get up. Start to take possession because God wants you to be blessed. The big problem with biblical prosperity is that it's only about you in an exceedingly, significantly limited way. Verse 2 and 3, his offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright, upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Here's here's God's promise and the premise of your expectation. Your children should be living in the blessing of God because of you. Future generations should be living in the blessing of God because of you. Everything we build, we should build with future, future generations in mind. Everything we do with our money, everything we do with our mouth, everything we do with our lifestyle, how we are to our children, how we are to the generations coming up after us, should all be with a desire that I want my children and my children's children to do better than I ever did, and they'll do that because I'm going to leave a foundation of faith. I'm going to leave a foundation of legacy. I'm going to leave a foundation of finance for my children to walk into. They should be blessed because of me. Your family should be blessed because of you. God blessing you is only in an exceedingly small way about you. God's blessing is always about others. Your blessing is not about your blessing. It's about you being blessed to be a blessing. God spoke to Abraham. He said, I will make you a great nation and I'll bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. We just did a series on faith. That statement came to Abraham when he was 75 years of age. And God spoke to us, gave us a prophetic word. Word of Life Church right now has just turned 75. God spoke to Abraham about his future, about abundance, about blessing, about expansion. God spoke to us as a church, said, you're 75 years old, so we're not going to live in our history. This is the platform to launch off for what God wants us to do in our future. Instead of walking around the property and saying everything's big, God said, no, I want you to walk around the property and say everything's small. I don't want you to see that what you've done is it. I want you to see that this is the platform for launching into the years ahead for what God's got for you, that our future can be better than our history. That God can be about what God wants to do in the generations. And if you hung around young people like I've hung around young people, you know that the generations coming up after us, they need the church. They need the kingdom of God. They need Jesus as their Savior. They need rescuing. 
God doesn't bless us to be a reservoir that it all comes in, me, my, my thing. God's called us to be a conduit where it pours out of our life. Verse 4 says, Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lands, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. We receive grace so we can be gracious. We receive mercy so we can be merciful. We receive righteousness so we can be righteous. We receive blessing so we can be generous. We receive justice so we can show justice. We receive his favor so we can give God's favor. We are blessed so we can be a blessing. It's never about your blessing. It's about God being generous to you and you being generous to the world around you. We've got to start getting generous to the world around us. I'm not just talking about generous in money. I'm talking about generous in your attitude. Ge- generous, generous in your actions. Generous in your thinking. Generous in your words. Don't be that person that's jumping online as soon as somebody says something and criticizing online. Don't get into the negative comment feed. Be bigger than that. Just be bigger than that. Just decide on the inside, that's not me. There are multiple times that I've wanted to have a fake Instagram account and just go in and punch back on a few things. But I don't want to lower myself to the standard of somebody else's negativity. We've got got to live bigger than that. God has called us to live bigger than that. You are blessed, and it's about God being generous to you so you can be generous to the world around you. Verse 7 and 8, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He'll not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. Biblical prosperity is established in the heart Uh, It's an established heart in the face of the difficult. Biblical prosperity says, you know what? I'm living life. I'm not going to escape hardship. If you're breathing, challenges are going to come. If you're living, disappointment is going to come. I I can promise you, if you've come to this church because you got hurt in another church, I'll put money on it. You're going to get hurt here. Because if you just live long enough, someone's going to hurt you. Now, there's a difference between getting hurt and being hurt. I am not a hurt person. I've been hurt. I am not hurt. Because you've got to learn to forgive and move on. That's the bigness of God's generosity. You've got to get into your, into your spirit. But hard times are going to come. Difficulties are going to come. It's not the hard time. It's how you respond. My friend, Phil Camden, I talked a little bit about him last week. I just visited him in Australia 10 years ago. was diagnosed with ALS. Motor neurons disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. No cure for it. It's terminal. They can't cut it out. They can't chemo it out. They can't do radiation, nothing. But he's outlived. He's outlasted. And when Phil got diagnosed with motor neurons disease, he had to resign his church because he needed energy for other things. And he made a decision. I am going to be a missionary to the MND community. He looked at Versary, Adversity in the face, and he said, you're not going to win. You're not going to control me. I I didn't ask for this disease, but it's my lot, and I am going to live over and above what's come my way. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to keep my faith in him. I may not like the way this is going down. I may not like what's happening, but I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it for the glory of God, and I'm going to become a missionary in a community of people, and that's how I'm going to be. My friend Paul de Jong, who passed his life in uh, New Zealand, great church there, one of the largest churches in New Zealand, recently got diagnosed with brain cancer. And when he got diagnosed with brain cancer, a very aggressive form of brain cancer, he made a decision. You know what? God is going to call me to go online and not ask people to pray for me, but for me to go online and pray for people that are sick and struggling. And so he made a decision. Have I got disease in my body and I'm believing God to heal me? I'm going to reach out in faith and I'm going to start to pray for other people 
people and believe God to heal other people of cancer, other people of disease, and just rise up on the inside. And so, so adversity is going to come, but you've got you to you punch back. You've got to fight back in the Spirit of God. I've got friends who've been impacted by cancel culture, but they've just made a decision that cancel culture cannot cancel my calling. Faith calls it blessing even when it's not tangible. Your blessing is not about the absence of challenge or the absence of difficulty, but it's the ability to find prosperity and praise and joy and victory in the face of it. Paul wrote to the Philippians, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said, I know what it is to be chowing down on food, asking for seconds, eating seconds, taking a doggy bag home, eating it later on. And I know what it's like to be searching for somebody's left doggy bag on the side of the road. He, he, he said, I know, I know what it's like to be a base and I know what it's bound, but I, I've learned the secret and that's to be a praiser of God in all situations. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm here to tell you today, you can get through this situation. You can get through this difficulty. You can get through this obstruction. You can get through this hurt. You can get through this pain. You can get through the pressure that's on you right now. You have a God who is for you, a God who is on your side, and I'm not sure what you're walking through right now, but I'm here to encourage you. Somebody at home, watching online, needs to get stirred up on the inside that you are going to make it in Jesus' name. You're going to get there. You're going to have breakthrough. You're going to make it in the name that's above every name at the name of Jesus. Here's a big problem with biblical prosperity is it becomes bigger when held loosely and shrinks when it is held tightly. Verse 9, he has distributed freely. This is what he wrote in Corinthians. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. In the New Testament, there was a dispute that arose. Peter, James, and John, Paul, uh, Barnabas, different guys, between the gospel. Should the gospel only go to the Jew or should it go to the Gentile? Peter, James, and John totally committed to taking the gospel to the circumcised. But God calls Paul to take it to the Gentiles, take it out to the world. And so there's a conflict in doctrine. But at the end, they say, you know what, we may not be able to completely agree in doctrine, but the commonality is this. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to. To do. When blessing comes, God intends us to hold that blessing with an open hand, not with a closed fist. Proverbs tells us in chapter 11, one gives freely, yet grows richer. Another withholds more than he should give and only suffers want. In that, the way that's written is almost like, this doesn't really make sense. The one who gives is, aren't we losing if we give it? He's like, no, the one who gives receives. And the one who holds it, if we hold it, shouldn't we have it? No, if you hold it, you're going to lose it. So the Bible says here, one gives freely, it grows all the richer. Another withholds more than he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And the one who waters will be watered himself. Our key to being blessed is to be generous. I believe that God wants to bring word of life. We are a blessed church. We are a highly favored church. God has been awesome to us. We have a responsibility, I believe, as a church to minister to our community. We have for years as a church been really good at doing a lot of things overseas. The scripture says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. We're gonna continue to do things in the uttermost parts of the earth. That's a part of the fabric of who we are. 
and we've been good at doing to the uttermost, but we've been fairly lacking, if we're honest, at doing things in our Jerusalem and our Judea. I believe God's calling us to be able to be generous in all sorts of ways. May 21, the end of this month, we're going to take up a heart for the house offering. For those that are new to our church, once a year we take up a special offering over and above our tithes and offerings, and that helps us do some projects that we need to do to make our facility better for people who are coming. And so we want to make an investment into our children's ministry. We want to make an investment into building some translation, translation booths. We have two up there right now. We have the goal to have four, which means we could translate into eight languages on a Sunday. And so we have some projects. You can check that out on the heart for the house uh, uh, form outside, and you can see where we're investing. And on May 21, we're going to come together. We're going to take a heart for the house offering, and we're going to advance the kingdom of God here. Then on June 24, you heard about that this morning, we're having our Hope Expo. Now, June's a Saturday. It'll run from 2, 10 in the morning to about 2. And this is our beginning. This is not the end game. This is the beginning. This is step one for us to be able to be a blessing to our community and to help the poor, to help the struggling. We've got to help people less fortunate than us. We've got to help people even in our own church that are struggling financially. So on June 24, we're going to have our Hope Expo. We have a Job and Finance Expo, trying to help people get connected with employment. We're going to have a Health Expo here and help people. We've got a uh, dental van coming. You can give blood. You can get your blood pressure checked to see if you should give blood. We, we've got a whole heap of people helping uh, find uh, uh, insurance and things like that. Then we're going to have our Hope Marketplace where we sell some furniture and household things and clothing at a really reduced price to bless people. All that money, the proceeds, will then be sent to children in Peru and El Salvador will outwork us. And we're working towards uh, a, a goal of having an app where we have our hope heroes, where you can find a need during the week and you can look on our app And we would have the resources to be able to meet the need that's in our community. So you find someone that needs a bed, you go on the app, you find out that we've got one in supply and we give you the bed and you take it and you can give it away. So we've got a goal to be able to launch this ministry where we really minister and reach out to the poor on Hope Sundays, Hope Heroes. We're we're looking to uh, renovate our bus. We have two buses one that we, use, we can use, another one that's more short-term. And so we're going to gut it, and we're going to put tables and chairs, make it like a mobile diner where we can go to areas where there are homeless people and we can bring them on the bus and we can feed them right there. And then we want to be able to take that into communities where children are struggling to get a meal and drive the bus into communities and feed the communities around us. We've got a vision to start impacting and changing uh, the life of those that are struggling. Uh, We are blessed so we can be a blessing. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. He who is generous to the poor lands to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. It's the cycle of God. Bless people, get blessed. Bless people, get blessed. Bless people, get blessed. It's the cycle that God wants. We are blessed to be a blessing. The big problem with biblical prosperity is that people have a problem with biblical prosperity. Verse 10. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. When the kingdom of God prospers, when the the people of God prospers, it offends the devil, it offends the religious, and it offends the haters. Now, the Bible says the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. But I would put it to you that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it, but it can come with a lot of potential hostility. That if you get really blessed for whatever reason, uh, unsaved, unchurched people struggle with the prosperity of and the blessing of God's people. People make all sorts of crazy, juice statements about the church and blessing. 
They want you to stay poor. They want me to stay poor. But whoever benefits from being the, the kingdom of God being poor is not the kingdom of God. The only one that benefits when we're broke is the devil. We can't do what we need to do without finance. And God wants to put finance into our hands, not so we can hold it tightly, but that we can hold it loosely and we can give out to those who need it. Now, I, I know some people are gonna go, well, Jesus was never rich. And that's not quite true. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, for you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that you, by his poverty, may become. It doesn't say he who was rich became poor, so you who are poor could stay poor. That's not what it says. And listen, I, Jesus could live in a mansion on planet Earth, he would still be living in poverty compared to heaven. The moment he stepped into our environment, he stepped into, compared to heaven, poverty. I would also say, if you do have a problem with prosperity, you probably want to go to hell and not heaven. Like heaven's going to suck for you. It's going to be a horrible experience. You're going to, you're going to die. You're going to wake up. You're going to take one foot onto a street of gold and you're going to lose your mind. Gold? What's wrong with borrowing some dirt from hell? What well, gold? You're going to walk up to a gate made of pearl. That's one big oyster. Who ate that oyster? What's wrong with wood? Couldn't we got some secondhand half burnt wood from hell throwing a gate up? Isn't that a bit extravagant? Have you read the book of Revelation? Have you seen how God acts and how God lives? God's not relying on secondhand handouts from hell to build heaven. So as soon as Jesus stepped out of heaven into earth, he was already lacking. So he who was rich became poor, so you and I who are poor can become rich. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be, have prosperity. That's God's blessing for you. He wants you to have that. You've got to get your head around it. You've got to get your head around it. Here's the deal. God never intended prosperity just to be blown on you. He intended to be a thing where you would give it away and you would bless others. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. If God doesn't add sorrow, then stop feeling guilty. Some of you here, you don't have the prosperity worry at the moment, but some of you are blessed. You are blessed. And God says, stop feeling guilty. If the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, he doesn't add sorrow to it. Don't add sorrow. Don't add apology. There's no a limit to need in our community. We live in a broken, messed up, confused, hurting world, and the church can make a difference if God's people learn how to prosper and live in his abundance. There's no limit to opportunity. I get overwhelmed. I, I, I was speaking to somebody this week and talking about a need in a certain country. And when you, when you start talking about needs, you just get overwhelmed. When I was in Ghana earlier this year, we drove from Accra to, up to the Cape Coast. And just that drive will break your heart. The need is so overwhelming just on one road that you go, God, how's that? How's that going to be met? Then I meet people here in our own church, and I hear their story. I'm like, God, there is just so much need in the world, and the money. There's no lack in the world. It's just that money is in the wrong hands. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. But you will be sorry if you give thoughtlessly, carelessly, from manipulation, spiritual extortion, or deceptive promises from con men. This takes us back to the context of 2 Corinthians. As it is written, he has distributed freely, is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Look at the context of that verse. Look at the context of that quote from Psalm 112. 
It goes back to verse 6. The point is that whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. There's the prosperity. There's the sowing and reaping. Each one of you must give as he has decided in his heart. Generosity is a decision, not an emotion. If you give out of emotion in any church service or any environment out of emotion because you're emotive, chances are you're going to have giver's remorse. You're going to give what you can't give. What you're you're going to give what you can't afford to do. But if God speaks to you and you can give out of wisdom, it says here, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God lives, loves a cheerful giver. The Message Bible puts it like this. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your own mind of what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories, arm twisting, God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, verse 9, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. See, the problem in the church is too many Christians have been manipulated by the slick conversations of preachers on on TV and over the years, and they've been hurt. They've They've been wounded because they gave out of emotion. They gave they gave out a compulsion. They got guilted into giving. There are a few times when I was a young Christian. I remember being in a large meeting, and Russell, you can come, uh, in, a, in a large meeting, and they were taking up, I think, an offering for the building. And I was a brand new Christian. I'd only been saved a few weeks. And I, I remember this prophet getting up, and he was just very slick and very manipulative. And I remember giving everything that I had, even to the point where I went and gave my shoes. I just put my shoes up there. Totally useless giving shoes. They can't do anything with them. No one's buying my old smelly shoes. But I remember leaving thinking to myself, if that's church, I don't want to be a part of it. If that's what the kingdom of God is, I don't want to be a part of it. I felt manipulated. I felt conned. I felt forced. But I've learned over the years when I've read the Bible and I got to this this verse, that if I ever feel conned, It's not that person's fault, it's mine. Because if I made a decision what to give, like like take our tithes and offerings. I know what I'm going to give every week. I have a set amount. I know what my tithe is. So when Anna's taking the tithe or anybody's taking, I can be another church. I know exactly what I'm going to give, exactly before I get here. So when I go online and I make my gift, I can make it out of an act of generosity because no one's forcing me. No one's manipulating me. No one's conning me. And this is how you say strongly. That's how you become generous. You are generous when you make up your mind. This is what I'm going to do. So take our May 21 offering. Just pray, ask God, get a number and do that. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel burdened. Don't feel pressured. Just make a decision that you can give in faith. Maybe this year you say, I can't give anything. I've got no money to give. Then don't give anything. That's cool. Pray for other people to be blessed so they can give. It doesn't rob you, but you have to make your own decision. Don't be manipulated. Don't be conned. Don't be forced by me or anybody to do what God hasn't called you to do. And so when you make a decision, this is what I'm going to do, then you can come in and you can invest and you can give freely with a heart that says, God, I believe that you're going to bless me back. And the Bible says, with whatever attitude you give, God's going to give back to you. He delights in the cheerfulness and the love and the grace and the freedom of the giver. And then God gives us back that way. How many people are glad that God gives us back that way?
Here's the last thought. The big problem with biblical prosperity is that not enough of us are living in it. We're existing, not thriving. Some, are, some here today are even struggling to exist. Maybe you're watching online and that's you. And you need to respond, I don't know, with an emoji or a prayer request. Type it into the chat or whatever you need to do. And you cannot bless because you need to be blessed. And a message like today is not so you can walk out feeling guilty that you can't do it. It's to say, let's acknowledge I can't do that right now. This is where I'm at. This is just my reality. It doesn't make me a bad person. It's just where I'm at. And I need breakthrough. Some of you need an immigration status changed. You need a miracle. You need God to move in a miracle. Some of you need your health restored. You can't work because there's sickness in your body and you haven't been able to work. You get exhausted. You get tired. You just can't work. Some of you, it's because of coming into the nation and you're trying to find a job, trying to find the right job. You need a better job. You've got a job that's paying, not paying enough, but you need a better job. Some of you, some of you are struggling because you got ripped off. Somebody took a lot of money from your life and now you're struggling to make it back. There's a lot of adversity against you right now. You're up against it. And so for you, it's like, God, how do I, how do I get out of that position of lack? How do I get out of this position of need? But we want to pray for you today. We want to pray for you today. Thank you so much for joining Word of Life Church online today. Our prayer is that your faith was strengthened and you were inspired. We would love for you to be a regular part of our online family. The best way to do so is by clicking that like button, hitting subscribe, and ringing that bell so you don't miss out on any life-changing content. If you have more time today, go ahead and click another one of our videos right here. If not, we love you. We can't wait to see you online again soon. God bless.